Morning. Welcome to St. Michael's. It's good to be worshiping with all of you today, those who are here and those who are joining us online. If you are joining us online, I hope you'll follow along using the worship guide or the Book of Common Prayer. One quick heads up about one of our songs, our last communion song, which is on page 16, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. The words may be new to you, but the tune is the same as Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So hopefully it will be easy to sing along. I was reading a commentary this week that talked about how one of the things that happens in worship is that we tell the truth about who God is and we tell the truth about who we are. And I think as, we, as I was looking at our uh, collect for the day, uh, for this week, I think it does that well. It names that we are frail, and it names that God is merciful and caring. And so I invite you now to stand as you are able in body or spirit, and let us, as frail humans that we are, praise our good and merciful God. begins on page 123. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have
Our collect of the day is on page 618. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep your church, O Lord, by your perpetual mercy. And because without you, the frailty of our nature causes us to fall, keep us from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable for our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
The first lesson is a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 9 through 12. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will, shine, will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 138. Please stand and let us read responsively by whole verse. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Even before the gods will I sing praises to you. When I called upon you, you heard me and gave me increase of strength. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. Your servants have been glad in the They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shall you refresh me. You shall stretch forth your hand upon the furiousness of my enemy, and your right hand shall save me. You may be seated. The second lesson is from the book of Acts, chapter 11, 1 through 18. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about co going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning comes from John chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, he replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can go ahead and have a seat. I have a confession to make, which is that I have preached this sermon before. And what's more, you have heard this sermon before. (laughs) Almost exactly two years ago, though it sort of feels like 20 lifetimes. But as I sat this week with this passage, 
which Jerry Mowry chose as one of his favorites, and we'll hear from him in a moment. Um, I will admit it's one of my favorites, too. But as I sat with it this week, different things stood out to me, but nothing captured me with that kind of spark that usually says, there, your sermon is in there somewhere. And so I decided to dig back through the files on my computer to see if I had preached on this passage before, and if so, what I had had to say. And it turns out that the sermon I preached two years ago is said pretty much everything I would want to say about this passage now. And I am guessing or hoping that if I forgot I preached it, then maybe you forgot you've heard it before. Um, but even if not, the truth is that things hit us differently when we encounter them at different points in our lives, right? That's why rereading a favorite book or rewatching a favorite movie can be so rewarding. So I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak a fresh word to each of us through this sermon today. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Children everywhere seem to love to play hide and seek. So I remember a few years ago, some friends came over to my house with their kids there are three kids, and at some point during the evening, the kids decided to play hide-and-seek. Three children in my less than 900-square-foot house. And when I pulled back the shower curtain the next morning, there were kid-sized shoe prints in my bathtub. My eight-year-old niece has mostly outgrown it now, but she used to love playing hide-and-seek. And when she was really little, she would tell me where to hide, and then eventually she graduated from that, but then for a while after word, when it was her turn to hide, if I didn't find her within about 45 seconds, she would start making noises to guide me to her. Right? Because it turns out that my niece knew what we seem to forget as we grow older, which is that while the official point of hide and seek is to hide, the real fun comes in being found. And I think it's a lesson that we have to keep learning in life. Because the older we get, the better we get at hiding. And not just during the game of hide and seek, but we get better at hiding our feelings, our actions, our shame, our flaws, whether real or perceived. The older we get, the better we get at hiding ourselves. So we may share funny photos on Facebook or vacation pictures, talk about relaxing moments, share witty comments, but we share very few of the hard moments, the times when we've yelled at a loved one or are sad or lonely. We post about certifications we've received or tests we've aced, but not the test we failed or the mistakes we've made. I think most of us are not actively trying to create a false picture of ourselves. It's just that who wants to share the hard stuff, right? Or else we hide behind an attempt at perfectionism, believing that if we can just be perfect, the perfect student or employee or boss or friend or spouse, if we can just be perfect, then finally we'll be good enough. We hide our family problem, wary of revealing mental illness or addiction in our families. I can't tell you the number of people I know who will not go to counseling because it would require them to reveal the stuff they usually hide, and they would rather suffer than admit to someone that things aren't as perfect as they seem. This tendency to hide all or part of ourselves has been around since the beginning of humanity. We see it in the story of Adam and Eve who hide from God after they had eaten the fruit from the forbidden tree. The woman at the well who Jesus encounters in our gospel passage today, she was likely hiding as well. 
That's probably why she comes to the well at noon. There aren't too many other reasons to do the hard manual work of drawing and carrying water at the hottest part of the day. So most likely she was avoiding those who would be there at the cooler times, in the morning and then the evening, when most women would come to get water. Why would she be avoiding them? Well, this passage has traditionally been interpreted that it is because her life is scandalous or immoral. After all, she's been married five times and she's currently living with a man who is not her husband. But if we dig a little deeper into the cultural norms and practices of that time, we learn that the truth may have been a little more complex than that. In Jesus' day, there were any number of reasons a woman could have been married numerous times, none of which had to do with her morals or even the value that she attached to marriage. So often, young women were married off to men considerably older than them. And if if a woman's husband died and he had a surviving brother, the woman could then be married to the brother in a practice known as leveret marriage. And if that brother died, she could be given to another surviving brother and so on, all in hopes that she would produce eventually an heir for her family. So a younger woman could end up a widow multiple times over through leveret marriage to her husband's brothers. Or perhaps the woman in today's story had been married and divorced numerous times. In Jesus' day, women did not have the power to divorce their husbands, but husbands could divorce their wives for just about any reason, including an inability to have children. So it could be that the woman Jesus meets at the well was guilty of nothing more than infertility. And she had been cast off time after time as she proved useless to her husbands. Even if we might want to fault her for living with a man, not her husband, we should remember that single women had almost no ability to make a living for themselves in that culture. And so if she didn't have a male relative to provide for her, she may have sought that provision and protection wherever she could find it. Whatever the particulars were of the woman's situation, she wouldn't actually have had to have been guilty of immoral behavior to have been treated like an object and experienced rejection. And it seems clear that she is an outcast, that the story that's told about her, or the story she tells herself, is that she isn't worthy to be around others. This is a woman who is steeped in shame, and that shame has made her want to hide. But when you come to the well in the middle of the day and bump into Jesus, you end up being the one who is found. The woman, whose name we don't ever learn, comes to the well with her water jar and finds Jesus sitting there by the well. He's thirsty in the heat of the day, but he doesn't have anything to get water from the well with, so he asks her for a drink. She is shocked. By most accounts, the cultural norms of the day meant that men didn't talk to women they weren't related to. And they certainly didn't talk to women of questionable reputations. And men who were Jews absolutely didn't talk to women who were Samaritans. So the woman is taken aback, and she asks Jesus why he, a Jewish man, is asking her, a Samaritan woman, for water. And Jesus responds with what I think is a typically cryptic Jesus response. If you knew who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Their conversation about water goes on and forth, 
until the woman asks Jesus to give her some living water so that she won't have to keep coming to the well. So she won't have to keep hiding in broad daylight. And that's when Jesus replies with what seems like a total non sequitur. He says, go, call your husband, and then come back. Now that's it. That is the moment that the woman has been both waiting for and dreading. The moment when this man, like all the other men, is going to tie her worthiness and her respectability to whatever man has been willing to claim her. And you can imagine the disappointment and the resignation in her voice. The way she picks up her water jug, ready to return to the village because she's been unable to hide even here at the well at midday. I don't have a husband, she says, almost to the ground her voice full of the familiar tone of disappointment. You're right, Jesus says. You've had five husbands, and you're not married to the man you're living with now. Now there is a way to read that statement as incredibly shaming and full of condemnation. But the woman's response suggests that that's not how Jesus says it. If she had felt shamed and condemned, she probably would have left. She would have run away and found somewhere else to hide. But she doesn't. She stays. And she initiates a pretty deep theological conversation with Jesus. A conversation Jesus fully participates in. In fact, it is by far the longest single conversation Jesus has with anyone in all of the Gospels. And it ends with Jesus telling her that he is the Messiah. It's the first time in John's Gospel that he makes this claim about himself. Jesus reveals this woman's deepest hidden truth, the thing she most hoped to hide, But he also reveals his deepest hidden truth, the truth of who he really is. And I can't help but wonder if knowing who Jesus is helps the woman see herself in a new way. All of which shows just how non-shaming, in fact, how unshaming, Jesus must have been in the way that he spoke and related to this woman. Brene Brown says that empathy and connection are the antidotes to shame. And Jesus has clearly shown this woman both. Leaving her water jar behind, she runs back to the village, back to the place where she has lived in shame because she wants others to experience what she has experienced. Come, she says, to anybody who will listen. Come, Meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, if you are someone who has ever experienced even the smallest amount of shame for something you have done, which is to say, if you are human, then the last person you're going to want to introduce other people to is the person who can tell them everything you've ever done. But this woman who has spent so much of her life in shame, this woman wants people to meet Jesus. She wants people to meet the person who wiped away her shame with empathy and connection. She wants people to meet the person who showed her the love that sought her out in her hiding place and gave her the joy of being found. What are you hiding or hiding from today? I can almost guarantee you that there is something. Maybe you're hiding loneliness or depression or anxiety. Maybe you're hiding some kind of self-medicating behavior that you have used to try to hide those things from yourself. 
Maybe you're hiding from a history of abuse or trauma. The thing that feels like it will overwhelm you completely if you get anywhere close to it. Maybe you're hiding some way that you feel like you have failed in life, in your career or your family or your relationships. Maybe you're hiding from the things that you fear, things like helplessness, dependency, even death. Hiding is such a universal human behavior in our fallen world that most of the time we don't even realize there's another way to live. Every day, the Samaritan woman would pick up her water jar and go to the well at noon. Every day, she would pick up this water jar that had become a reminder of her shame and a symbol of her hiding. And every day, we do the same. We pick up the things that we hide or that we hide from. We pick up the stories we tell ourselves or the stories we've been told about what those things mean. We pick up our shame over and over again. But once she had met Jesus, the woman left her water jar at the well. She didn't need it anymore because she had been given living water. So she left her jar at the well and went to bring other people to meet this man who with his love had washed all her shame away. That's the invitation that Jesus offers us today and tomorrow and every day to come out of hiding, to experience the empathy and connection and love that wipe away our shame, to experience the joy of being found, and to invite others to experience that joy too by introducing them to the one who satisfies our thirsty souls with living water. Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber has written, The living water offered by Jesus Christ binds your lowest point. It flows to your original wound. The thing that you spend so much energy trying to heal through all the insufficient ways. Whatever that lowest point of you is, whatever the deepest wound the vilest sin, the damaged thing in you is. The living water of Christ's compassion will find it, can find it, has found it. The living water of Christ's compassion and love finds our lowest point. It washes away every last bit of the shame that keeps us in hiding, and it fills us so we never thirst again. So may God grant us the grace to drink deeply from that well, the well of Christ's compassion and love. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you are able and let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 127 of the prayer book. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. The prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. For Foley, our Archbishop, and John, our Bishop, Aaron, our Rector, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, I ask that you continue to strengthen them, encourage them, put a hedge of protection around them, and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our Joe, our president, and Glenn, our governor. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, I invite you to add your own petitions silently or aloud. Lord, I ask you to touch your faithful servant, Jim Ryan, and dissolve every blood clot. Dissolve it into nothingness. And we bind the formation of any other clots that could develop. Touch him, Lord. Strengthen him, encourage him, and help him in his grief as well, Lord. I lift up my sister Mary, and I ask you to deliver her from the chronic excruciating pain. The doctors cannot heal or do anything for her. But Father God, you are the great physician, and I know that you are the God of all flesh, and nothing is too hard for you. I ask you to touch her, turn her heart to you, Lord. Help her to See with spiritual eyes and heal her body in Jesus' name. We lift up Harry and ask that him to be touched by your Holy Spirit and the work you have begun in him will be completed. You will restore health unto him 
and heal him of his wounds. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful, Most merciful God, God, we confess, we confess that, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. undone. We have, we have not loved you with our, our whole heart. We have, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the, For the sake, sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's greet each other with God's peace. Ask Jerry to come on up, if he would. Um, this gospel passage was the one that he chose as one of his favorites, so I've asked him to come share a little bit about what it means to him. You know, she preached this sermon again, and this sermon that she just finished is one that has stuck in my mind for the last two years. It, it just touched so many things that has happened to me in life in so many different ways. And let's just start with the well. When I was a kid, that's how we got our water. And we drew it. We didn't pump it. We didn't have electricity to do it. It came up by hand. And when you're out there with a hoe, and if you haven't experienced the joys of using a hoe, I don't recommend it. <laughs> but it would be about noon, and it's hot. And in about late May, when you're still hoeing corn because you've got to get that soil aerated so in the event it should happen to rain, it can do some good. Uh, you come back to the house for, for lunch or dinner, as we called it. And you had to come by the well. Now, there was buckets of water in the house, because that's how we kept water in the house. But it had grown stale, and there was nothing more refreshing than dropping that bucket down about 40 feet into the earth and pulling up that cold, cold water that seemed extraordinarily cold at that time in my life. And 
I can just see Jesus. I mean, this just hits me so close after having walked because they didn't have bicycles or cars or anything. He, he walked, coming to that well, and no way to get that water and this lady appearing. And I don't know, you know, how thirsty he was, but I'm sure he wasn't uh, about to succumb or anything like that. Jesus, you know. <laughs> And uh, uh, the conversation that went on from there, and some of the points in that conversation just reminded me then again of my life. Uh, the guy you see before you hasn't always been this way. Uh, I was a pretty mean rascal. Uh, I sat there, and every Sunday I look up here and see these, and I'm sure you do too. And I can't help but think about how many of them I broke. And we can start at the top there. And uh, I don't think I ever had any other gods except be called Boo's God. I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time chasing that. Uh, good looking girls, <laughs> I spent a lot of time chasing them. Didn't catch many, but I did chase them. Uh, you come on down, uh, and Thou shalt not take the name of God, uh, the Lord thy God, in vain. Well, I was a soldier. I can assure you, I broke that one many, many times. Remember the Sabbath day. Yep, did that too. Honor thy father and the mother. I was a teenager once. <laughs> I, can, I can assure you that one got put on the list. Thou shalt not kill. I was a soldier in Vietnam. And into my 30s, even after that and before that, I carried a gun for near all the time. Uh of North Carolina, Fort Bragg. Some of you have probably been there. Bragg Boulevard, Bloody Alley. Uh, yeah, I carried a gun. Uh, fortunately, I never used it. Did, I did shoot at some people, but I'm a very poor pistol shot, thank God. Should not commit adultery. Folks, I was a lead singer and guitar picker in country bands that played in a whole lot of honky-tonks. Not proud of it now, but that's, that was life when I was growing up. Uh, and by growing up, I mean coming to the point in time where God came into my life. Shall not steal. Spent some time in Germany. And on payday, when soldiers got paid once a month, uh, in the part of Germany I was in, the, the bartenders would sit because, I mean, the bars would be crowded on payday night, I mean. And they'd set beer with a case up on the, the bar and there'd be a crowd of people up there getting it. Yeah, I'd done some five-finger discounts on that beer. And um, it was easy to get to and I took it. Shall not, shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I'm not so sure about that one. I think I can kind of skip by that one pretty, pretty easily. I, uh, generally, when I have a problem with my neighbor, I go and talk to him. And sometimes it's not pleasant, but we, we get to understand each other. Should not cover thy neighbor's house, neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox. Uh, my neighbor has had some pretty nice tools that I've wanted. So I've, I've been down that road. My point is that, praise the Lord, somebody came into my life and helped me make a change that has made me so different from that person that, uh, I mean, I had a nickname when I was a kid at, at home. I mean, I was mean. Uh, it was right after the Second World War, and they called me Hitler because I wouldn't back up for nobody. I didn't give anybody a chance 
nobody, nobody messed with it. And Joe, I'll tell you, uh, they still don't, they still call me that, <laughs> don't they, Joe? But it, it, was, it, was, it was different. And then this person came into my life, she's sitting there. And we've been married about a year. And she said, whether you're going to or not, I'm going to church. And, I mean, she threw the gauntlet down. And, you know, so I began to go, and I never, ever had that road to Damascus conversion that I've heard so many people talk about. And I talked to Erin about that not long ago when we were having lunch. And she assured me it didn't happen that way for everybody, that there's a gradual change that comes over you and one day you realize that, but for the grace of God, he's reached down and touched me and made me a person that I can be proud of. And by the grace of God, he put all this away, never to be remembered again. And I am so proud to be his child. And through this passage and the way it was preached, those things come back to me so often. So can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. What to preach, I'm just going to call Jerry. Um, also, it's his birthday, so let's wish him a happy birthday. God is so good all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, to move on to business seems inadequate, but there are a few announcements that I do need to make. Um, we will not have Bible study next week. We're taking a week off, but be back uh, the following week. We do have fellowship time after uh, the service today, so I hope that you will head over to the fellowship hall for that. We won't the following two Sundays, but there's going to be a ministry fair, a Greenwich's ministry fair in the fellowship hall. So we're invited to go over there, have some refreshments, and see all that's going on at Greenwich and find anything that we want to join in on. We are warmly invited to do so. Um, let's see. Bob, I will have you come on up. And Bob's gonna, Bob is our uh, delegate to our Bishop's Electing Synod in October. He's going to tell us a bit about that. Thank you very much. Yes, I was directed to be the delegate <clears throat> by the <laughs> vestry. Uh, first point being, a year ago, the Anglican College of Bishops directed our Diocese of Mid-Atlantic to conduct a search. We've had a committee working very hard for a bishop candidate to, I won't say replace, but to enter in as bishop for our diocese, because we all love Bishop John Guernsey and his wonderful wife, which we are going to see in the very near future, so stay tuned. Uh, and then um, this committee worked very hard, as I said, multiple candidates. On the 17th of July, they declared that there are three candidates going forward for selection uh, by the diocese, three rectors. If you haven't seen the message of the 17th of July, I will ensure that each and every one of you get a copy of this via email. If you don't want it via email, contact me and I will provide you a copy. It will give you background on all three of these wonderful candidates. So where are we today? On the 15th of October, yours truly will attend the, uh, the Bishop Election Synod and vote. Our Church family has one vote. I will carry that forward. And uh, one of these candidates will be selected by the entire diocese. I am your delegate, but I'm also, and this is what I add to the title, I'm also your representative. So I want your thoughts, what you think in terms of the three candidates and who you would prefer to see uh, embrace this a tremendous duty as bishop of our diocese. So I will get an email out to all those that have email addresses with our church. Otherwise, contact me and I'll provide you with the details about the candidates. Thank you. Thank you. So the three candidates.
three candidates are uh, David Hankey, who's the rector at Restoration Anglican in Arlington, Patrick Ware, who's at uh, Grace Church in Winchester, and Chris Warner, who is uh, rector of a church down in South Carolina. Um, so uh, as Bob said, he'll send you the email. There was also a link to the information in the newsletter that went out uh, last month. Uh, Tammy. Bob votes and I vote. So the, there are lay delegates from each congregation, the number depending on the size of the congregation, and there are clergy who vote. And we vote separately by orders. Um, and somebody has to get the majority of both clergy and laity in order to be elected. Um, so Bob is casting the vote, but he is, I think, wisely and humbly soliciting your input. Bob. No, I mean, not necessarily. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so please do be uh, in prayer. Do check out the website that's linked in, in what Bob can send you and I sent out. There are uh, spiritual autobiographies for each of the candidates. They have answered, written, they've written answers to questions. There's a video of each of them. There are links to sermons that they've preached. Um, so, uh, I know that most of the time, day to day, it doesn't seem like who the bishop is may have a lot of effect on your lives, but the bishop has a great amount of uh, impact and influence on the direction of the diocese, on the care of the clergy, and, and other things. So I would encourage you to be in prayer about this and for, for these uh, candidates and for our diocese. So thank you, Bob, for that. Um, speaking of bishops, uh, as Bob uh, mentioned, Bishop John and Meg will be visiting here on October 2nd. That will be his last official visit to St. Michael's before his retirement in February. So uh, we will plan a very nice reception for him. I know you'll want to come and, and welcome him and give thanks to him for all his service to us over the years. Uh, the bishop's visit is also a time when confirmations happen. So if any of you are interested in being confirmed, let me know. Let me tell you briefly what confirmation is. It is the sort of adult uh, profession of faith and the profession that you are choosing to live out that faith in an Anglican context. So uh, typically if you're, say, baptized as an infant, then as you reach uh, maturity, whether it's a teenager or an adult, you would, you would be confirmed as you make a public profession of that faith that your parents made for you in, uh, in your baptism. Um, so if you have not been confirmed in the Anglican or Episcopal Church and want to do that or want to talk about whether you might want to do that, uh, please let me know. I'd love to have that conversation. Then we'll do a few confirmation classes in September before the bishop's visit. Bob. I would add that uh, Ethel and I have a uh, <laughs> And what happens at confirmation is that the bishop lays hands on you and prays that the Holy Spirit would fill you and empower you for the ministry that he has called you to do. And it is powerful. I will just say that. Um, so I would, again, if you've not been confirmed, invite you to consider that and would love to talk with you about it. Tammy. So I I I didn't realize the importance then as I do now since God is truly rich in my life in a lot of ways. And so I was you know, as a girl I could be the same work as you see. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Great. So let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Spirit here? Yes. This is our God. We are his people. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our delight to give you thanks and praise, great Father, living God, supreme over the world, creator, provider, savior, and giver. From a wandering nomad, you created your family. For burdened people, you raised up a leader. For a confused nation, you chose a king. For a rebellious crowd, you sent your prophets. In these last days, you have sent us your son, your perfect image, bringing your kingdom, revealing your will, dying, rising, reigning, remaking your people for yourself. Through him, you have poured out your Holy Spirit, filling us with light and life. Therefore, with angels, archangels, and all in heaven, We proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. for giving up your only son to die on the cross for us who owe you everything. Pour your refreshing spirit on these gifts and on us as we remember him in the way he commanded through these gifts of your creation. On the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Amen. His body was broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. Therefore, Heavenly Father, hear us as we celebrate this covenant with joy and await the coming of our brother, Jesus Christ. He died in our place, making a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, the perfect sacrifice once and for all. You accepted his offering by raising him from death, and granting him great honor at your right hand on high. Amen. Jesus is Lord. This is the feast of victory. The Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Hallelujah. And as Jesus taught us, so we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ is alive forever. We are one body. Draw near with faith. Thank you. 
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. God most high, we thank you for welcoming us, teaching us, and feeding us. We deserve nothing from you, but in your great mercy, you have given us everything in your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you and give ourselves to you to be sent out for your work. Grant us your blessing now and forever. Amen. And now all our problems we send to the cross of Christ 
all our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ, all the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ, and all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. And may Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.